Welcome to my presentation, Hands-On History, Teaching Experimental Archaeology in a School Setting. If you'd like to follow along with me as I speak, scan the QR code in the corner of this slide. Hi, I'm Natalie, and today I'll be offering tips for teaching experimental archaeology to young students. But first, let me introduce myself. I teach Roman technology and myth makers at Glasgow Middle School in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, USA. My classes center the ancient classical world. In these classes, my young students, ages 11 to 15, reproduce the products and processes of ancient Roman daily life through experimental archaeology and hands-on history in STEM labs. Some of our past projects include constructing small pottery kilns and building a mosaic sundial based on the analemma described by Vitruvius, the Roman architect and engineer. We just completed our most recent project, building a Roman road through our school's campus to serve as a sidewalk in a waterlogged area. I'll give details of these projects and many others as I deliver my paper today. If you'd like to contact me about this presentation or anything in it, please feel free to reach out to me at the email address listed here. I run a small website of hands-on activities for young students studying the classical world. You can find the address for that website and other presentations, videos, and lessons on my link tree. And don't forget to follow me on Twitter for news and updates on classical STEM. Let's get started. If you've never thought about teaching experimental archaeology or you're not a teacher, that's okay. Besides teaching a class that uses experimental archaeology, my students and I offer outreach events to the general public in my city, similar to the ones you might see in open air museums. The methodology I talk about today can be useful in those settings too, but mainly I'll be talking about teaching young students aged 11 to 15. As you may know, these little humans need a special level of engagement to keep them interested, and they are the future of archaeology. It's important to get them interested in the past early. Students request my classes more than others. I believe they do so because of how I plan for hands-on learning that invites kids to imagine themselves in another time and place. Tip number one, don't be afraid to teach outside your comfort zone of expertise. Start with a topic you think will interest children. They can get excited about mundane things like games, tools, and daily life. After you've picked a topic, research everything you can about it. I'm not an archaeologist, although I have studied archaeology and enjoy reading about it, but I'm not an expert on everything from the Roman world. For example, when I learned about the Vet Weiss Freudsheim Dice Tower, a famous Roman artifact, I started reading everything I could find on Roman dice towers. I knew I wanted to present this artifact to my Roman technology classes because they would find it interesting. Don't let your ignorance or inexperience in a particular subject keep you or your students from learning. Start with Wikipedia and Google Scholar if you have to, and then move to more academic search tools to find pertinent articles. Don't forget about YouTube as you explore a topic. Many researchers use a hands-on approach to perform their research, and they prefer to show their work rather than write about it. The research I did on this artifact led to my developing a wonderful STEM challenge in which students designed and built their own Roman-style dice towers. Through this work, they experienced the daily lives of Roman soldiers and children who use such technology. And before I began this unit of study, I knew nothing about it. So don't be afraid to teach outside your comfort zone. Research is time consuming, but a lot of fun. Tip number two, reach out to experts. Experts absolutely love to talk about their work and are thrilled to be consulted. When I was planning our Roman Road project, I wanted to read the work of Dr. Eric Paler, who wrote The Traffic Systems of Pompeii, but to read his articles, I would have had to pay an expensive database membership fee. I decided to email him, tell him about our project, and request his help. He was thrilled to hear about our road project, and not only sent me copies of the articles I had requested, but also selected a couple of others that he thought would help. His encouragement and assistance were critical to our project. In addition to access to articles, reaching out to experts can expand your contacts in an area of interest. You never know where such contact might lead in the future. If you're lucky, the expert you reach out to might be a perfect fit to partner with for a project. When I asked for help on our Roman Road project from our local Department of Transportation and Development, 
I never expected to gain a full-time partner in Dr. Tyson Rupp now, a civil engineer and a PhD, who had studied Roman road building as an engineering student. In addition to guest lectures for my students, he demonstrated modern surveying equipment, fired limestone to make concrete, and got supplies donated for our project. If I hadn't reached out to this expert, our project would never have been so successful. Tip number three, secure funding. Once you've settled on a project that you want to pursue, seek funding for it immediately. In the US, many industrial companies like ExxonMobil and other businesses offer grants for STEM projects. Since experimental archaeology fits under the STEM umbrella quite nicely, it's been fairly easy to secure this funding, in my experience. If you've never written a grant, don't be afraid to try it. Successful grants nearly always ask about collaboration with community partners, so be prepared to mention that. You'll be asked to submit a budget, which can be time consuming, but if well planned, it will help you think through the supplies you'll need for the project and how to effectively use them. Sometimes you'll need to think outside the box for funding. Does your project benefit your school as a service project? Does it benefit the whole student body? Because our Roman Road project added a sidewalk to the school's campus, it was considered a service project and qualified for a service grant. Organizations like ASM International offer teacher grants for projects related to material science. We were awarded one of their $500 grants for a lesson on ancient Roman concrete. Tip number four, plan the sequence of instruction. After breaking up the project into smaller pieces, I use a blank calendar to write in daily activities. For example, when my students built small pottery kilns, we didn't just go outside and start building. The first lesson was a lecture on the archaeological evidence for Roman pottery production. Next, the students explored how pottery was used in the ancient world. Because I knew that young children might have trouble throwing pots on a wheel, we focused on simple hand-built clay forms. In the next lesson, the students researched clay votive body parts that the Romans and Greeks dedicated at healing temples. Next, the students sketched, designed, and built small models of their kilns. We even took a trip to visit a pottery kiln at a local university where a PhD student spoke to my students about how kilns are built. Finally, when our bricks were delivered, the students built their actual kilns, covered them up with mud, and fired the small votive pieces they had created. Know that each lesson built upon the next, leading us to the final product and big experimental archaeology experience. I started with the big idea in mind, but broke it into many small lessons leading up to it. Tip number five, engage your students. Young students need to be engaged on a deep level. They don't just want to watch a teacher give them information or even just show them. They want to do things. When designing experimental archaeology lessons, student engagement should be the number one priority. This commitment can get complicated. For example, when I wanted my students to study stone cutting for mosaics, I made sure that I had enough equipment such as stone cutting hammers and hardy wedges to accommodate all of my students. If it's not possible for each student to work with the equipment, students can work in pairs assisting and checking each other. Since we were creating mosaics for a large sundial, I assigned each pair of students to create the mosaic for one of the numbers or months on the dial. This individual approach gave the students ownership and a sense of pride for their contribution to the larger overall project. Next, when participating in a large collaborative project, carefully plan the role of each student for daily lessons. For example, when my students learned to use a groma, the Roman surveying tool, I had to make sure that while two students were siding with the groma, my other 28 students had jobs to do. They had to measure the roadway space by pacing it or walking it the ancient Roman way. Students don't just want to stand around and watch others do things. They want to participate in a meaningful way. Tip number six, make a detailed list of supplies needed and order them early. Keeping detailed lists with costs and money spent will be important if you've earned a grant, but this process will also help you keep organized so you can reimburse yourself for costs you've incurred from your own pocket. Once you receive the supplies, try the activities you've planned ahead of time. When I wanted my students to mix oak gall ink, I had ordered a ferrous sulfate that I wasn't sure would work correctly. I reached out to my chemistry professor friend to check, and then I tried the process myself to make sure it worked. 
Checking details like this before you teach a lesson to your students will ensure that the lesson goes smoothly without the students becoming disengaged when something doesn't work correctly due to a supply error. Also, consider whether your students will be able to use the tools and materials safely. Some young students don't use their hands to develop fine motor skills needed for tool use. Simple tools like scissors can be challenging. Students can really help each other in partnership arrangements. Tip number seven, keep going. <laughs> Even when students complain about how hard it is, keep going. Sometimes things will go wrong, keep going. When we were finished with the construction phase of our Roman road project, despite our best efforts to keep people off the wet concrete, a biker rode through it and ruined our work, leaving a huge rut down the length of the road. The kids and I were understandably upset. We gave ourselves time to process the loss of our hard work, and then we decided to focus on how to fix it. I showed the students pictures of ruts in ancient Roman roads and reminded them of an article written by a road archaeologist on the use of molten iron to fix cracks in Roman roads. We also discussed how the Romans handled graffiti and vandalism. We came up with creative ways to fix the issue that the students had a part in. Just because students are young doesn't mean they can't think through problems and offer solutions. This mindset is an important one in STEM pedagogy. Encourage your stu young students to view problems and setbacks as opportunities to learn and be creative. And last tip number eight, have fun. Not all experimental archaeology will be publishable or worthy of further study. Sometimes you'll be reproducing the work of other archaeologists to help your students learn. During our mosaic sundial unit, my students learned so much from British stone cutter and mosaicist Lawrence Payne because he was willing to share his expertise. Through their work cutting stone into tesserae, they didn't produce new information that could be published in an article, but their experimentation allowed them to deeply understand the art of mosaic and even more importantly, how ancient mosaicists lived the physical troubles they must have had, and how hard yet interesting their lives were. It's okay to use experimental archaeology to spark questions about the daily lives of ancient Romans or any group of people who isn't around today to speak for their own experiences. As our Roman road project was nearing its end, my students wanted to know if we would still be working outside for other projects because they found it fun. Learning is so much more powerful when it's enjoyable and experimental archeology span when presented in an engaging and hands-on way can make history much more meaningful and powerful for young students. Thanks so much for coming to my talk today. I hope you enjoyed it.